Thank you, Tash. Uh, my name is Moha. I'm a scientist at NCAR, and uh, today I'll be talking about uh, enhanced streamflow forecasting using ensemble data simulation. Uh, I'll show a, a study case from Hurricane Florence, uh, flooding events in 2018. Um, these are some of my collaborators that I would like to thank uh, before uh, kicking this off. Okay, so to begin with, um, uh, just as some kind of motivation why we are interested in streamflow prediction or forecasting. So this is uh, Hurricane Florence. Uh, uh, Hurricane Florence uh, started as a tropical wave of the west coast of Africa, and then it strengthened into a tropical storm uh, before making landfall over the Carolinas uh, as a category for hurricane. Um, the winds that you know reached uh, up to 150 miles per hour uh, during this hurricane, um, uh, tons of precipitation came in. Uh, so we had uh, some coastal communities in North Carolina uh, receiving up to 35 inches of rain. Uh, obviously, this uh, caused cat catastrophic damages to coastal communities with damages up to $25 billion. Um, and the, 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 the worst thing of all is the freshwater flooding that happened, uh, you know, uh, when uh, statistically it, it greatly exceeded the levels observed at uh, both the Hurricane Matthew and Floyd uh, combined. Um, so um, having said this, uh, you know, uh, we're interested in predicting major floods during extreme uh, rainfall events, obviously for many uh, you know, uh, reasons. Uh, number one, we would like to save lives, limit damages if we can via advance warnings. And uh, uh, to me personally, uh, I think this, uh, you know, freshwater flooding has a lot of, uh, you know, social and uh, economic uh, impacts. For instance, if you look at this flooded city in North Carolina, you know, all of these uh, people in these uh, communities uh, um, have their houses damaged and they end up homeless, uh, you know, after, after the fact. And uh, um, uh, if we have a system that uh, could uh, allow us to um, um, to warn these people or to you know to um, uh, limit the damages, that would be great. Um, so um, in this talk, um, uh, we are interested in uh, um, uh, solving this stream flow prediction problem by coupling the wharf hydro model, which is the um, uh, research compartment of the national water model. Uh, with uh, our data simulation toolbox, which we use at NCAR, that's the data simulation research testbed or DART. Um, in this figure, I'm just showing um, um, a quick, you know, configuration of the model. So you're starting by the weather forcing engine or WARF in general here. Uh, you get some input to the uh, NOAA or the NOAA MP with multiple parameterization land surface model. Uh, this is where you model, you know, soil moisture, skin temperature, snow depth, snow pack. Um, now the NOAA or the NOAA MP has a two-way couple uh, coupling with uh, what the with the terrain routing model. Um, from there we go down to the uh, to the aggregation. Uh, so the National Hydro uh, Hydrology um, data set in the U.S. produces around um, three million catchment or reaches uh, over the entire uh, CONUS domain. Um, and then uh, the, 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 uh, the 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 essentially the the lower end of this of this whole. Uh, uh, compartmentalized uh, model is the channel routing model, which I'm gonna focus uh, um, um, focus uh, on, on this talk essentially. Okay, so this coupled uh, data simulation uh, modeling system we, we call as uh, HydroDAR. Um, 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 this is, you can see here, a kind of um, um, discretized version of uh, our domain. So this is the South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia here on the top. You're looking at stream flow. And um, it's important to notice that we are working with an unstructured grid. So you don't have a gridded kind of cells that are close to each other, uh, but rather, um, you know, we're working with reaches uh, or streams or rivers, if you like. Um, and I'm annotating the figure with the major rivers in the, in the region. So here for this domain, we are working with almost 70,000 reaches. Uh, uh, we, we do hourly stream flow assimilation and this uh, stream flow data is coming from 107 uh, USGS or United States Geological Survey gauges that you can see here with the uh, black asterisks. Um, in fact, the gauges give you data after every 15 minutes, but we do some kind of super obbing to assimilate every hour. Uh, we use the ensemble common filter with the 80 members and again using, using DART here. Um, um, as, you, as it's usual, the case with, the, with, these, with these studies, uh, you know, you build a system, but it turns out that it's, it's tricky and nothing that straightforward. Um, so we had to do some certain enhancements to our data assimilation system to make it uh, work properly. Um, um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to just list them and uh, uh, at the end for, focus on our, um, you know, uh, novel approach here, which is the localization here. Um, 
but uh, the first enhancement that uh, we we added is the is the forcing an ensemble uncertainty so it turned out that we we needed to create to add some variability in our ensemble to keep everything you know uh, healthy um, and that and and that uh, we did that in, in in two different ways so first we perturb the fluxes that are coming both through the channel and the conceptual groundwater bucket model and the second thing that we did is we perturbed some uh, channel parameters. Uh, we did not do parameter estimation. We just uh, worked with, a, with an ensemble that uh, had perturbed uh, parameters. And these parameters are shown here in the figure. So these are six different channel uh, geometric uh, parameters. Uh, we call that multi-configuration ensemble, not to confuse with multi-physics ensemble, where you really run different physical configuration of the model. Here, just you know, each member is seeing different channel configuration, essentially. Um, the second thing that we did, uh, uh, we did uh, uh, adaptive uh, uh, multiplicative inflation. You know, inflation is used uh, um, usually to tackle variance underestimation due to sampling errors and model biases. Um, here we are looking at uh, this algorithm, the spatial and temporally varying uh, adaptive algorithm that's both changing in time and in space. Um, so the whole idea of this algorithm that you, ass you, you, you assume the inflation uh, to be a random variable and you estimate it using the data through bias rule um, and it's recursive. So whatever um, updated value of inflation you have at one data estimation cycle becomes the prior for the next cycle. Um, as you can see here, you start with some prior here. It's happened to be an inverse gamma prior for the inflation. You construct some likelihood using the easiest statistics that we, show for, uh, that we saw from uh, uh, Joe's presentation uh, uh, earlier. And then you multiply these two, two things together to get, uh, to get an updated uh, posterior estimate of the inflation. And in the domain, if you plot that, uh, you can see that you, know, that you have different inflation value for different reach uh, um, in your domain. Um, one third thing that we had to do is uh, Gaussian anamorphosis. Um, um, you know, keep in mind the stream flow is a positive quantity, so um, it doesn't follow any Gaussian kind of behavior. Um, and we're working with the ANCAF, which, is, uh, which imposes a linear and a Gaussian update. Um, you know, so we had to do some kind of variable transform during the update to um, you know, both respect the, phys the physical, uh, uh, the physical uh, uh, process as uh, being positive, uh, the stream flow, and to fit more in the linear uh, Gaussian update of the ANCAF. And this is just a representation. You know, if you are working with this good stream flow distribution, you do a simple ENCAF update, you end up shrinking your, uh, your, your variance and you had to truncate some unphysical values, but you can do anamorphosis either empirically where you construct a CDF, you invert, uh, you do the update in the, in the transformed space and then you go back to the physics or some analytical functions, for instance, the algorithm that gives you something near Gaussian, you do the update and you go back to, to the physical space. Um, now, along the stream localization is, uh, uh, is, the, is the new thing that we introduce here. So usually localization is uh, used to tackle, uh, you know, uh, spurious correlations uh, because of small ensemble sizes. You have to taper or eliminate these spurious correlations. But since we are working with this unstructured grid, we had to come up with a smart idea on how to do localization. Okay. Uh, so if you think about your Kalman update as this equation here, so you have the analysis members equal to the forecast members from plus some increments. Um, and then you have this localization factor that you, you include over there. Now, APS localization, or again, along the same localization, aims to mitigate not only spurious correlations because of the limited ensemble size, but also physically incorrect uh, correlations between unconnected state variables in the river network. So um, you could be actually working with two reaches that are physically very close to each other, but they are unrelated because they belong to different catchments or basins. Um, so here I'm showing uh, how this APS localization looked like. Uh, for two different scenarios. So these are five different gauges. Um, we have uh, here 400 kilometers, here's 200 kilometers. Uh, and this is for Gasparic one. So the colors uh, really represent the value of this alpha factor in here. Now, some characteristics about this uh, uh, localization scheme uh, is that you know, it only adheres to the river network. So uh, for each observation, it only impacts the reaches that are upstream and downstream from the, from the gauge. The second thing is downstream from the gauge, uh, the information only flows downstream. So, um, you know, be, below the observation, the information doesn't go back up, upstream. So we have, we end up with this kind of tree shape, uh, like, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know kind of images. And the other thing is that uh, the total number of closed close reaches really depend on the size of the basin. For instance, if you look at this basin, when you went from 100 kilometers to 200 kilometers, you added a lot of more reaches upstream because the basin is bigger. Whereas for this, uh, for this gauge here, you didn't add much, you know, because just the, the basin size is small. And thirdly, 
um, and most important thing in my opinion, uh, um, observations in different catchments do not have any closed reaches. And you can see here in this, uh, in this figure here um, that uh, these two uh, gauges, uh, they don't impact the, the reaches that are in the other basins. Uh, so we put this to the test and we compared it with the regular localization. And by regular localization, I mean here the, you know, the, the standard Euclidean distance-based uh, localization. Um, so we are comparing ATS localization here with 100 kilometers to regular uh, localization with 20 kilometers, 10, 5, 2, and 1. Um, and just to show you that in, in terms of a hydrograph or in terms of a stream flow time series, so this is ATS localization with 100 kilometers, a regular localization with 1 kilometer, um, uh, this is the open loop in yellow, and um, we have uh, the observations in, uh, in asterisk. And this is a very good behavior with ATS localization. With one kilometer, you're seeing that uh, uh, the, the prior and the posterior members are just far from the observations. We are rejecting more observations. If we increase that to, um, to two kilometers, nothing much happened. You see that the ensemble is trying to, to fall and, uh, uh, to fall and you know, kind of uh, get closer to observation, but it ends up following the open loop. Um, with five kilometers, the rising limb improves, improves. So if I go back, you see here, we are better fitting uh, the, the rising limb of the hydrograph. Um, 10 kilometers produces very good results. Still, the ATS is better. If you check, we are better. We are closer in the, in the rising limb and the falling limb of the hydrograph. But when you go to 20 kilometers, things start uh, breaking again. In fact, I, could, I, I tried with more than 20 kilometers for regular position and things were breaking down. You see here some behavior that is not so nice. Um, but we, the ATS localization, we, we could increase the localization radius uh, very much and still things don't break because the localization really adhe adheres to the, to the river network. Um, and then, you know, because we are working with a new territory, we wanted to tune this uh, ATS localization. So we looked at the radius. Uh, so I'm looking here at the hydrograph from four different gauges uh, in the domain. Uh, so we, we, we tested 50, 75, 100, 150, and 200 kilometers. Um, um, it turned out, so um, um, I'm just showing the observations in black asterisk and the open, DA, the open loop or the new DA in the, in the dashed line, just for reference. Uh, sure, it turned out that uh, um, um, the 50 and the 75 kilometers are too small to, to, to give you meaningful information and 150 and 200 are just uh, too far. Uh, it gives you a spurious correlation. So we stuck with 100 kilometers. And the last thing we did is we optimized also the correlation function. So we, we, we checked whether it's what behaves better, Gaspari cone, boxcar, or the ramp box, boxcar. And we plotted all of that in a Taylor diagram for all the gauges. And as expected, the Gaspari cone gave us uh, the best results here. Um, so this is the, 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 what we did. So this is the HydroDart, uh, provides skillful our uh, stream flow estimates. Um, it mainly introduces a long stream uh, localization. It does a bunch of other things like, uh, you know, cool data simulation algorithm. It also supports parameter estimation that I did not talk about today. Um, ITS localization, you can think about it as a topological kind of localization scheme. Uh, it improves the information propagation and uh, produces better results than the regular localization. And one last thing, um, these are the um, uh, GitHub pages if you would like to look at them uh, for this work. Um, uh, future work, we are looking at the entire CONUS. We will do a reanalysis for the entire CONUS domain, and we look at some hybrid e and CAFOI approaches. There are some other cool projects happening at the same time. We will end up hopefully with the, uh, coupling both with the LSM and the, and the, and the channel routing system. Uh, we'll look at the weak versus strongly coupled when we assimilate both stream flow and soil moisture. Thank you.